Right, I, I guess I'm going to make a start. Um, hello, my name's Rob Fletcher, as some of you may know already. Um, I've been using Groovy and Grails for a number of years now and recently joined uh, the open source team at Netflix. Um, there's my Twitter, if anyone's interested. Um, this talk is about, this talk is called Hybrid View Rendering with Grails, so it's really an expansion on one section of a talk I did previously called Grails for Hipsters, and this talk is focusing just purely on the, on the section of that talk which covered using sharing view templates between server-side rendering and client-side rendering. Um, so let's get started. Um, so let's define some terms. What do I mean by server-side views, client-side views, and hybrid views? Um, server-side views are things like GSPs or CGI bin scripts or even static HTML files. So these are the pages rendered on the server in all cases. Um, this is kind of the way that web pages have been delivered since time immemorial, since the web was invented. Um, everything's rendered on the server and delivered as an entire HTML document. Um, one of the limitations of this protocol is that the browser can't maintain any kind of state but in transitions from one page to the next. Um, and there are various kind of workarounds that we have to deal with this. We've got session affinity, we've got cookies, we've got various other ways of passing data using the query string and, and all kinds of things, uh, local storage these days. Um, but effectively, it's a stateless protocol with some workarounds. So this is, this is kind of what you, when you start a Grails app by default, this is what you're using. Um, Client-side rendering is the kind of, over the last five or six years, has become the, the hot new way of doing things with one-page apps. Um, and this is building on, on Ajax, right? So Ajax was, was something that was actually developed by Microsoft and pioneered with um, Outlook. Um, and it's a way of delivering, communicating between a, a web page and the server in the background, as you pro I'm sure you know all this. But one page, a one-page app kind of builds on top of that by d building an entire stateful framework around Ajax so that you can have you can maintain state in an application that's running in JavaScript in the browser page, and you can just communicate pure, purely in data uh, with the server, so you're not delivering entire web pages. Um, this went really mass market in about 2004 with, when Gmail came out, and it it's kind of was the first big, hugely successful one-page app, I guess. Um, there are a lot of frameworks for doing this kind of thing these days. Obviously, there's Backbone, there's Ember, there's Angular does a sort of variation on the same, the same idea. Um, but essentially, it's static resources typically, and then JSON over REST. Hy hybrid rendering is um, a kind of mix of these two things. So the idea is that you can use the same view templates on the server as you do on the client. Um, so you've got a server that's capable of rendering a given URL, a given resource, as an HTML page or as JSON. And in different circumstances, it can do one or the other, depending on which is appropriate. So let's look at the kind of what the differences really are between those three models. Um, so traditional server-side views, um, what happens when you, requ you initially request a page, it pulls down HTML and JavaScript from the server. When you follow a link to, uh, to the next step in that, in that page, it does exactly the same thing. Now, hopefully, indicated by the transparency here, that JavaScript <coughs> is going to be cached. Um, but it is, making an H it is probably making an HTTP request, a head request, to say, has this, uh, has this um, resource changed? And hopefully, the server will say, no, you'll get a th here's a 304 empty content. So it's reasonably optimized, but it is still making some HTTP requests at that point. Um, if you follow another link, the same thing happens. If you, use, if you refresh the page or use a bookmark to get to a sort of deep point within that site, the exact same thing happens. So the crucial point here is that with this traditional server-side model, there is no difference, however you render the page, between following a link internally once you're into the flow of an application or diving deep into that application using a bookmark Everything, it always works the same way. You can optimize some things with, um, with caching, as I say, um, but fundamentally, it's the same model. Um, 
the cost to generate the HTML is probably a little higher because you're, you're not able to just send down a template down the wire. You've got to merge the data into that template on the server. That's probably going to be different data for different users, different individual pages. That's got to be done server side. Um, it's potentially computationally and I.O. expensive. Uh, and there's also a lot of redundancy here, right? Because if you think about the way Grails, for example, uses site mesh to decorate a page with a layout, all those layout elements are exactly the same between every page or between probably be between a group of pages. You might have multiple layouts on a site, but there are certain amounts of shared layout between individual pages, and you're re-delivering that every time you reload a page. So even if you're just following a link, links around the site, you're probably re-delivering, let's say, 25 to 30% of the same data with every HTML document. Um, the static assets, as I said, are re-requested every time you load a page. Um, even if you've got some caching optimizations on there, there, there will be some HTTP requests that happen from time to time. Um, so there is some redundancy here. So let's look at then what happens with client-side rendering, so one-page app type things. Um, you go to the site the f initially, and it pulls down a fairly empty, bare-bones HTML document and a ton of JavaScript, probably. And then once the document's loaded, it pulls down some JSON, which gives you the data for the initial page. Um, so you've, you've got some optimization in, the, in that you can have probably a much more bare-bones HTML document. It could potentially even be a static asset. I mean, I, th I think with the Grails app, you might typically do it with a GSP still, but it will be a, the amount of logic in that G GSP will be pretty minimal. Um, and the data is then fetched in a really pure form. So when you follow a link on that site, it just pulls down some JSON, pure data. If you follow another link, the same thing, it pulls down some, some pure data. Um, if you, now the trick is that if you go in to a deep area of this site using a bookmark, or if you happen to refresh the page once you've got to this point, it's got to do the whole thing again, right? So it's got to pull down that, all of that HTML, that JavaScript again, and then make another request for, the, for JSON. So the interesting thing is that that request for JSON only starts after the HTML um, and the JavaScript is loaded and you get a DOM-ready event in JavaScript. That, that's at the point at which it requests that JSON. So there's kind of some inefficiency there. And there are other, other issues with this model as well. What happens about SEO? What happens when a Google bot or a Bing bot, if such a thing exists, I guess, hits that URL directly. Does it get some JSON? Does it get, is it capable of rendering the view it needs to, to actually make any sense of that page? Now, we know uh, there was some news just a couple of days ago that Google has announced that their, their bot is now capable of running JavaScript applications and, and scraping kind of sensible content out of um, pure JavaScript one-page apps. But Google's not the only game in town in terms of search, right, on indexing of sites. So is it sensible to rely on that um, when it comes to your SEO strategy? Now, for some apps, it, it may not matter at all. But if you're, if you're a, a site that's kind of trying to generate organic traffic, then that's, that's a really important point. Um, another, is, another interesting thing here, which is kind of on a whole other talk topic, is, is what happens about accessibility. What happens to people using screen readers or who have, don't have JavaScript enabled for one reason or another? It might be a small minority of users, but it's really not fair to, to leave them out. And there are ways to tra track all that, but it's kind of non-trivial with this, with this model. So then, with the hybrid view rendering model, the idea is it kind of combines these two things into one, into one approach. So when you, when you go to the page initially, you get HTML and JavaScript, and the HTML has the data merged into it already, so it's kind of a pre-rendered page much like the traditional server-side rendering model. When you then follow a link within that site, you just get JSON. And you've got, a, you've got the same kind of one-page app type flow here that's not re-rendering anything. It's just taking that new data and merging it into an existing view that it's got in that JavaScript. Follow another link, the same thing. What happens if you use a bookmark or refresh the page? Exactly the same as the first, as the first step. So it, it can pull that pre-rendered page down again, it can use caching to pull down what's potentially quite a large amount of JavaScript. Um, and hopefully, you've got enough cache optimization switched on in your server that that doesn't actually send any data the second time. So the advantage this has is 
a couple of things. Obviously, uh, this is really easy for a, for a bot to read because it's just a, when it goes to any URL directly, it's just getting an HTML document. So anything, any sensible bot will be able to read that easily. Um, the second advantage is there's none of this waiting for the DOM ready event before you start pulling data down. It's already in the page when it comes down. So you've got an improvement in page loading speed. So the, the focus of this talk is, is like, how can we do this with Grails? Can we, can we do this? Is it practical? And also, why bother? This kind of sounds like a lot of hard work, right? GSPs work. One-page apps kind of work as well. Um, this sounds hard. Why do we want to render the same thing on the server side and on the client side? What's the advantages? So as I've mentioned, the two, two real advantages are SEO and perceived page load speed. That's what this really boils down to. Um, and there's some interesting research been done on this topic of page, page load speed in particular. So when we think about Twitter, um, I don't know if you're aware, but if, I guess it's two and a half years ago now, Twitter announced that they were going to rebuild their entire site. They, they were initially using the kind of one-page app type model. They were going to re re rebuild their entire site to render stuff on the server so that when you follow the link to a particular tweet or a particular user's profile, it loaded much faster. That was, and they spent a year and dedicated 40 engineers to doing this task just to make the page load a bit, little bit faster because the, the user experience was improved and engagement was improved, and they considered that worth 40 man years effort to implement. Amazon claimed to have increased revenue by 1% for every 100 milliseconds they've shaved off page load time. So it's not really hard to shave 100 milliseconds off loading a page, and if you can increase your revenue by 1%, even if you're not making vast amounts of money. So this comes back to, is it worth doing this? Is it worth the effort? This is the point of it, right? Um, so the technologies that enable, enable this kind of approach have been appearing over the last couple of years. So in 2012, um, the Meteor framework, which you may have heard about, was announced. It's a real-time node-based framework that does exactly this kind of model. Among other things, it's capable of rendering the same views, server and client side, so you can do this kind of hybrid model. Um, as I just mentioned, a month after that, Twitter announced they were rebuilding their entire site to render stuff on the server by default when you hit a deep link URL. Meteor then got, and they're an, bear in mind, they're an open source project. They got $11.2 million of VC funding later that year, um, which I think is, is like, just blows out of the water any kind of record for a developer framework. Getting, getting VC funding. They're not selling a product here, right? They're producing an open source framework that guys like us can use to build apps. Um, yeah, and of course then in December that year I delivered a talk which was uh, about how to do this kind of thing, among other things, with, with Grails. Um, and there's a really nice article released last year um, by somebody from, who works for Air Airbnb called Isomorphic JavaScript, the Future of Web Apps, which was talking about exactly this kind of thing, um, using JavaScript-based templating frameworks to render stuff on client and server side, what the advantages were. Airbnb were also investing heavily in doing this. And there was some talk about their experiences, and they've actually come up with a framework as well. So um, a bunch of frameworks have appeared over the last couple of years. We've got Meteor, as I mentioned. Mojito is, uh, is YUI-based. I think it actually appeared before Meteor did, but it, it didn't massively catch on because Nobody really wants to use YUI. Um, it's a, there's Darby, which, is, which was a big competitor to Meteor. That looks really interesting. Tower.js. Um, Easel is quite a recent one. Render is Airbnb's entry into that space. And most recently, we've got React from Facebook, which generated a huge amount of buzz a couple of months ago when, when that was released. Um, so one of the... We've talked about SEO and we've talked about page load speed, but one of the touted advantages of these frameworks in order to achieve that is that everything is just JavaScript, right? So it's, it's therefore easy to run the same code, or theoretically easy to run the same code, server side and client side. So they, they, all of these frameworks kind of sell themselves on 
the idea of you have one app and it can run in the browser or it can run on the server or it can run kind of in somewhere in between, it erases that boundary to some extent. I think that's exactly the language Meteor uses. They talk about erasing the boundary between the server and the client. Um, so does this mean we have to do everything in JavaScript now? Um, you know, we're all from a kind of JVM background and groovy programmers. We, do we want to use JavaScript for any, everything? I don't think we have to, but what we do need is a technology that we can share between server and client for actually rendering the views. So we need a templating technology that's probably going to be JavaScript based. Um, so we've got another number of options in that space. Um, and they're all pretty similar, really. Um, Mustache was the first one. It's a really simple JavaScript based logicless framework. Handlebars is kind of an extension over the top of it, which adds in the concept of having view helpers, which are a little bit like, well, we'll see, I'll, I'll show you some handlebar stuff in a minute. Um, Hogan is um, Twitter's implementation of Mustache, which they claim is massively faster. Um, I haven't tried it myself because I think Handlebars is, is just kind of, from a de developer's perspective, offers a lot more capabilities. Um, and the interesting thing is that these things are pretty simple um, and they can theoretically be implemented in any language. And actually, Java ports exist for Mustache and Handlebars. And in, in handlebars, there are actually ports into Clojure, Scala, Go, you name it. There are, there are a ton of, of, of ports of handlebars. Um, so this is what a handlebars template looks like. There's no logic allowed in there at all, directly. So we have a, there's a helper allowed for doing something equivalent to the, the geach tag in a GSP. So that's just a method, a JavaScript method that this calls out to, which will look capable of looping over um, some data. The nice, one of the things I really like about handlebars and these technologies generally is there's none of that kind of global namespace that you have with GSPs where you can kind of set up a ton of variables and they're in, in your top level GSP and they're magically available throughout every template that, that, that's nested in there. Um, and that, can, that kind of stuff with a complex site can get really, really messy, really, really fast. And with um, handlebars and mustache and, and these templating languages, there's one context variable at any given time. And you can have helpers that switch that context to do path traversal and so on down using a kind of Java beans-like syntax. Um, but basically, you've only got one. You're dealing with one object at a time, no, no more than that. So this is rendering you know, a header, an unordered list of a bunch of items. And then this operator here is calling out to another template by name. Um, and here's that other template. So this is generating a kind of individual picture. So you, you would render this multiple times. Um, and this shows you how you can, on, on this slide, I'm using some custom helpers. So we've got one here, which uh, renders a, some kind of timestamp in a friendly format. Um, there's another one here that is figuring out if the person who uploaded this image is the current logged in user. And if so, we're going we're gonna to render out a button that lets them delete that image. So you, you, although you can't have direct logic in uh, handlebars templates, you can use helpers to apply logic. And it, it enforces that separation. So you can't do what you can do in GSPs, which is just kind of open up some angle bracket percent symbols and just start chucking groovy code in there and writing whatever the hell you like. You're, you're constrained to encapsulating your logic and helper methods. Um, so moving on to another aspect of the technology that, that is kind of important when we're talking about one-page apps and hybrid, hybrid apps is how do the URLs work? So um, the way this has worked in the past is that Google, I believe it was Google proposed this standard where you would use a hash bang URL. So, um, a hash URL, if you, in case you're not aware, is, is anything after that is kind of a client side. It's generally a ref initially used as a reference to an ID within the, within the DOM. But um, Google proposed that if you put a bang after it, um, that can be used as a kind of path which the JavaScript application is aware of. And interestingly, Google's bot will turn that um, hash bang into this query string because the, the important thing to realize here is that hash bang 
is not visible to the, to the server at all. Anything after the hash is not visible to the server. Google's bot will turn that hash bang URL fragment into a query string with a specific key. So that allows you, if you're using, doing a one-page app using a hash bang URLs, you can, you can do, opens up the possibility of doing server-side rendering of the same views. Um, but you know, this is kind of annoying having to deal with these type of URLs and over the last, you know, four or five years, there's a new JavaScript API that's part of the HTML5 standard called his, the history API. And this enables full control over, the, over what appears in the URL. So what you can do now is, that, is you can have, um, let's say, the portion of the URL after your site, so the path after the host, um, in, when that changes, you can intercept that with JavaScript. And instead of sending a request to the server, you can have JavaScript handle that change. And you can also manage, um, the, manage the content of that history so you can, you can manipulate it from JavaScript and do all kinds of interesting tricks. And this, this is a pretty mature technology now. You know, it's been in Chrome for four, over four years. It's even been in IE for a couple of years now, right? That's in IE 10. And even on the Android browser, that was the last one to adopt it, um, is, is getting on for two years ago now. So this is a mature technology. You can, you can feel pretty free to use this unless you've got an awful lot of users on Blackberries or something. And the nice thing about using this is that it's kind of, I've tried to write some of this code myself in JavaScript and it's kind of fiddly to manage it, but a lot of the frameworks, in fact, all of the frameworks now are doing this for you. So if you're using Angular or you're using Backbones Routing or Ember, this API is kind of invisible to you. You just don't really worry about it. And they're also capable of falling back to that hashbang style of URL if they encounter a browser that can't cope with the history API. Um, and the really nice thing about using, using the history API is that if your users copy the URL that's in their, in their, um, in their uh, location bar in their browser, they can share that and use it as a bookmark and it's, you know, it's just a standard URL that can, you can intercept on the server side as well because it's got a full path on it. It's not using hash fragments. Um, and you, can, you know where they are on the site. You don't have to rely on this trick of using some kind of dodgy conversion to a different format in order to even be able to access that path. So with the history API, it's just a URL. People can copy those, share those, use them as bookmarks. And they're crawlable. So this is kind of this is a, a kind of key enabling technology of of um, hybrid rendering. So let's look at how can we do this with Grails. Um, when I talked about this previously, I was using there's a plugin uh, for handlebars which was written by a guy I think he's in Cape Town in South Africa called David Tinker, and it's a really neat little plugin. It's a wrapper around the Java implementation of handlebars. Um, and the Java implementation of handlebars, in, um, if you didn't know, is also built into Rat Pack by default. Um, so it's not like it's a, the, the Java implementation of handlebars is not lagging behind the JavaScript version in any way. It's, it's pretty f capable. Um, and then you can use helper methods written in JavaScript as well as in Java. So you, you have the potential of sharing um, helpers between, uh, between client and server. You don't have to like, like reproduce those on the server side if you've got the kind of things I was showing you earlier where you know, you've got something that spits out a friendly time or works out if somebody's the current user. You don't have to rewrite those in JavaScript and Java. Um, but there are some problems with this, with this plugin recently because now we've got Grails 2.4, right? Everyone wants to use the asset pipeline, quite rightly, because it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, this plugin is really happier working with the resources plugin, um, and it kind of conflicts with the asset pipeline. Um, I wasn't able to get it working. Um, there is a Handlebars asset pipeline plugin, which what the, the way this works is that it takes those um, Handlebars templates that I showed you before, uh, which you've saved as .hbs files, and it compiles them into JavaScript functions and delivers those, Java, delivers those JavaScript functions to the browser. Um, now, the problem with it is that uh, the Handlebars Java implementation does not deal with those compiled templates. It deals with the raw 
original .hbs files. Um, and the asset pipeline plugin throws those away when you build a WAR file. And it doesn't actually provide you with a convenient way to locate those yourself from within your application code. It gives you a very convenient way to locate the compiled version, but not the original version. So this kind of makes it a little bit difficult to use Handlebars Java. Um, so given, given that we want to be using the asset pipeline, what can we use instead to render the uh, Handlebar stuff? And the answer, I think, is Nashorn, which is Java 8's really high performance um, JavaScript engine. Uh, the nice thing here as well is that it is to some extent backwards compatible with earlier, earlier versions of Java um, via the script engine API. So you can, it will fall, if you're on 7 or below, you can write pretty much the same code. And I'll show you some differences in a minute. Um, and you'll end up using Rhino instead of Nashorn, which is not as fast, it's not as optimal and so on, but it, it kind of can work. So let's have a look at some code using this. Um, so this is something I wrote as just kind of a proof of concept. Um, it's a tag lib that can render handlebars use, served up by the asset pipeline plugin. Um, so this is the initialization of, the, of this um, tag lib. And it has a, this bean here, the asset resource locator is injected by the asset pipeline plugin. And that is a mechanism for finding JavaScript files, CSS files, whatever the, the kind of resulting compiled optimized resources that the asset pipeline plugin is generating you can be found by that using the same path you, you would use in your GSP in the kind of include resource tag call. So that being, you inject that being there. Um, then you can initialize the Nashorn engine using um, the script engine API and you say, I want a JavaScript scripting engine. If you're using Java 8, that will get you Nashorn. If you're using 7 or below, or 6 or 7, this, this API only goes back to Java 6, you'll get Rhino. Um, you can say Nashorn specifically, but if you say JavaScript, then you get that kind of nice fallback. Then you can use that asset resource locator to find the handlebars library itself and load that into Nashorn. So that's the actual handlebars library. And you only have to do that once when the, when the tag lib or service or whatever, I've done it as a tag lib, you could have a service here um, when it's initialized. At, the, at that point, you could also load in any view helpers you may have. So if you've got a, a whole library of handlebars view helpers, you just load them in in exactly the same way as this. You just use the, use the URL of the, the kind of target JavaScript file, load it in using a, an input stream reader into the scripting engine. Then, here's the actual rendering part of it. So the, the tag lib for, for rendering the view itself. Um, it takes the same exact path to the template, but notice that's a .js file, so that's the compiled template script. Loads it into the scripting engine. Then it gets a handle on this object. So this is the JavaScript object that contains all of the compiled templates. So handlebars.templates is an object that has just a bunch of functions on it, which are the named template functions that, you've, that have been generated from your, um, from your .hbs files. So this, it takes that object and then invokes a method on it. So the target object is that handlebars.templates object. The name of the, the function on it is the name of the template, which can have, it can have forward slashes in it, so you can do kind of partitioning if you've got a ton of views. And then any parameters that that, that template needs, so the, the view model, basically. And notice here that that's, this is the kind of interesting difference in a practical sense between Nashorn and Rhino. That's a plain Java map. That's not anything fancy. You're not doing any kind of conversion here. Nashorn is really nice in that it can deal with um, Java objects in the raw state. If you're using Rhino here, you need to jump through some hoops. You need to, I, the, the only way I could get it working was by rendering that model map out as a JSON string, passing the JSON string into the script engine and parsing it as JSON using JavaScript, which is kind of, I imagine that's not fantastic performance-wise, and it's certainly not very
very beautiful code-wise. Um, so that's, in a practical sense, if you're not outside of any performance considerations, that's why NAS1 is really nice, because you can just throw Java objects at it. That can be containing GORM domain objects, anything you like. It just seems to work very nicely. You can call the functions on it from JavaScript. You can access the properties on it from JavaScript. Um, so then your view renders out. So if we look at what that looks like in a, in a Grails controller, it's really, really easy to use. So here we've, we're using the with format content negotiation system so that if the client is requesting JSON, we just render out, we load our model in, in the first place using GORM. If the client is requesting JSON, we render that out as JSON. If they want, if they want HTML, we use that tag that we just, we just defined to render out um, HTML built with handlebars using Narsorn. And it's, it's that easy. It's, this is pretty, I, I was really surprised actually by how straightforward this is. So using the asset pipeline and Narsorn <coughs> is much easier than when I tried, last tried to do something like this using handlebars Java and sharing templates between client and server side. This is a lot more straightforward. So yeah, there, there it's rendering the handlebars template out. Um, so the one kind of undry bit you have in this, you're sharing your view templates, you're not reproducing your, view, your handlebars view helpers. The one kind of undry thing you have here is that you need to define the same routes, client and server side. Because if you think about what's happening here, this is your Grails URL mapping, and this is your backbone root definition, or it could be Ember, it could be whatever. Um, if if somebody's using a bookmark to, to access, like say, a user profile or a particular picture on your website, Grails is going to see that URL and you need, you need to be able to render out that document. If they start at the root of your site and Grails renders that, that index page and then they start following URLs around clicking links, Backbone or Ember or whatever is intercepting those, those URLs and those, re those requests are never getting sent to the, to the Grails back end, except as some kind of REST request for JSON data. So JavaScript is intercepting those URLs when you, when you follow links in the site, and that, they never go to the, anywhere near the Grails URL mapping at that point. So you do need to kind of replicate all of your paths on both sides. Um, but obviously, what actually happens as a result of those paths is, paths is a little bit different. On, uh, on the Grails side, you're going to be calling a controller, which renders out a view in on the client side, you'll be loading some kind of, hand, uh, some kind of um, backbone view class, backbone controller that's doing something, ultimately doing the same thing, but in a rather different way. Um, so question may, you may have is, uh, is this a plugin yet? And the answer is no, but um, it would be a pretty good, it, it is honestly pretty damn easy. So I think this would be an awesome uh, hacker garden topic to take some of that some, some of that code I've got there and try and turn it into a proper Grails plugin that integrates with the asset pipeline. Um, you may notice there's kind of an elephant in the room here. I've mentioned Backbone, I've mentioned Ember. Um, there's, there's something that maybe some of you have heard of called AngularJS, uh, which I haven't talked about. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, the Angular model is a little bit different to to a Backbone app or a Ember app. Backbone and Ember are kind of imperative. They, they're, the code you write, the controllers you write, push the data to a view in an imperative way, whereas in Angular, the situation is kind of reversed where the, the, the view is the source of truth. You have an HTML document that's decorated with a, with a lot of um, Angular directives, and it's pulling in execution of code into the document as opposed to uh, executing a controller function that is loading a template and writing it out. So there's a subtly different um, mo approach there. And the downside of this is it's kind of not really very amenable to this kind of server-side rendering when you're talking about Angular because you can't isolate the view rendering from the execution of the app as, as a whole, or at least not in any easy way. Um, Angular's templating engine is not kind of a separate library, it's, it's part of Angular, 
Um, so you would have to be executing the entire application server side in order for this to work. But there are solutions, and in fact, one of the things you can do is do exactly that. Um, there's a really good article on Year of Moo about this approach, and also I believe HBO have taken this approach, which is to use a, there's a, a YouTube video with some guys from HBO talking about doing this. It's to use a proxy on the server that's running, ah, sorry, wrong button, that's running PhantomJS. So if you as a user go to this site, you download HTML, JavaScript, and, J, and JSON as normal, and it and it's behaves like an Angular one-page app. If you're a Google bot, hitting this site, the, you, that request gets intercepted somehow, whether it's browser sniffing, whether it's a slightly different u URL or whatever, um, and it runs through a proxy that's using PhantomJS, which is the headless JavaScript Node.js browser, to actually read to the data for that site and render it server-side. So it's effectively running the one-page application server-side and then serving out the resulting HTML to the bot. And this can also be done if that's, if that's just a user hitting a bookmark to a deep area of your site. You can do the exact same thing. Um, the downside is that, the upside is it's SEO friendly and you can potentially deliver some of those page loading speed optimizations I was talking about, but it's pretty difficult to set up. This is not trivial to set up this kind of thing. There are some projects on GitHub for doing this. There's one called Angular SEO. Um, and I've seen one or two others, um, and it's kind of lots of Nginx configuration and running, s configuring stuff on the server side. So to how, how you would go about end-to-end -end testing this in an easy way, I don't know. Um, and it's a little bit more hairy to set up than, than some of the other approaches. The other obvious approach you can do is just bake the J your initial JSON data load. If you're using GSP or something to, to render that initial page, you can just bake some JSON into the page and load it. Um, into your, into your one-page app. In Angular, this is actually really easy because they've got a caching service that's designed for doing exactly this kind of thing. So you can effectively prime an HTTP cache and say, right, this is the, this is the content for this RESTful endpoint. Put that in your cache straight from some JavaScript embedded in the HTML page. And then if anything requests that endpoint, it just serves it straight from cache without even going anywhere near the server. So it's really fast. And that's a really low-cost way of implementing something very like a hybrid view approach, you save that extra, extra step of making a, an HTTP request for JSON data after the DOM, DOM ready event, you still will not get a pre-rendered page. So it's kind of, it is not going quite as far as rendering everything on the server side. You will get potentially that kind of empty document that suddenly fills up with data. It will just happen a whole lot faster than it would if it's actually making an HTTP request. Another way you can do it is using a J, use serving the, the same data as JSONP and including it as a, as a synchronous resource in the head of your document, it's, you know, you, then you've got a, a third way to, try to render the same data, right? Which is, uh, you know, who needs yet another way of rendering the same data? But it's an option. Um, so that's basically the presentation. Hopefully that will spur somebody at Hacker Garden somewhere to uh, build a really nice plugin. So, um, I've got a few minutes left by the looks of it, so if anyone has any questions, please fire away. Yeah, the tricky thing, so the question is, how, how would the JavaScript work on the client side here? Because it's all being rendered by, um, Phantom JS and then served up as an HTML document. So this, you would have to write some special code that is capable of kind of, it's almost like getting the Angular app to start in a pre-configured state, yeah, pre-rendered state and pick up where it's left off. And with, actually, funnily enough, with Angular, that's maybe a little harder to do than it is with Backbone or some of the other frameworks out there. Um, because what will typically happen is you'll, try to get it to do that, but it will just go and re-request that JSON data anyway and overwrite it. So unless you've primed the cache properly, that you're probably not saving anything. You might have the pre-rendered page and then it will kind of silently do an HTTP request in the background and overwrite all that data with exactly the same data again. It is, so it's pretty difficult to optimize that. It's not, certainly not an easy bit of code to write to do that. Um, anyone else? Yeah. Uh, 
Um, um, that's a good question. So the question is, can you override the, going back to the much earlier slide, where we are loading the script engine, can we override, can we backport Nasorn to earlier versions of the JDK? Actually, that's a really good question. I don't know if, there's a, if, if, back, if Nasorn is available as an external library. It wouldn't surprise me if it was. Um, that would be something I'd be interested to go and Google after this. Um, because there's no reason it shouldn't be possible, I don't think. It's, it, it happens to be included in JDK 8, but I don't think there's anything to prevent it running outside of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Okay, so we've got a few minutes left. Um, that will give you some extra time to grab a coffee before the next talk, I guess. So thanks for your attention, and I uh, hope that was useful. <laughs>